Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that we've been lucky enough to implement here for over two years now. The product in and of itself is exactly what you need it to be, guys, with options ranging from being a workout provider, as in sending the workout directly to the student athlete's phones, to being a place where you can communicate with them and bring together multiple streams of data to be its own dashboard for you, your coaching staff, or the athletes. Or you can use what we've added to our our menu of Coach Me Plus activities, and that's Hydration Station, where all of this information that is provided is based off of research from the Corey Stringer Institute, where we're looking at weighing in versus weighing out and then providing optimal hydration uh, strategies for the student athletes by them selecting through the menu and tapping on what they'll take home with them and what they're consuming prior to the next practice um, when all the numbers at the top are lined up green. It's something we've had really good success with and the kids have really bought in on. Just another great example of the awesome product that you can find at coachmeplus.com. Guys, hop over to coachmeplus.com today and check it out. It's a product I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the distinct pleasure of sitting down and talking with Sam Gardner from the USOC to discuss his role out in California working with the Paralympians. Uh, Sam starts out talking about what his role is and discussing the different types of athletes that he gets the pleasure of working with. He, he dives right in and, and we go through each group and, you know, the, the things that he does with each of the groups. It's, it's really, really an eye opening and fascinating talk, guys. I, I absolutely love the discussion and can't thank Sam enough for his open and honest sharing with everything. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did because I, I really loved it. Let's get right to it. Sam, thanks for being on with us today, buddy. Hey, Coach. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, man. So listen, let's give a brief rundown of what you're doing out there in Cali with USOC. All right. Yeah, I'm in kind of a, a unique role. I'm heading into my fourth season now working at the training center down in Chula Vista, California. Um, I get to assist with resident programs, specifically our track and field program, which uh, – has a, has a pretty special group of uh, horizontal jumpers as well as uh, shot put athletes. And then on the Paralympic side, I get to take lead role working SNC for Paralympic sports. So working mainly with track athletes um, as well as para tennis in the quad open division, uh, a little bit with cycling and uh, in a remote basis with, with para triathlon. They don't have a resident program, but they come through on camp. So I get to uh, get involved with that as well. That's awesome. So let's start right there. Let's talk about what you're doing with the Paralympians, how all of this has gotten going, and let's just get into the whole setup because it's something that I think that uh, a lot of coaches really don't understand and should have much better knowledge of. Right. Yeah, Coach, it's uh, it's been an interesting process. Um, It's an area that that doesn't have – 
a lot of research behind it. Um, and you know, the digger you uh, the digger the deeper you dig, excuse me, the more you find out that there really is kind of a lack of, of common knowledge on, on certain um, areas and, and kind of general consensus on how to work with certain athletes with disabilities, specific disabilities within those categories. Um, so for me, I do a lot of work with visually impaired athletes. So coaching up uh, athletes who can't see, um, which for me has been a tremendous experience. Um, if you can coach somebody who's blind how to perform a snatch or a squat, I think you shouldn't really have any excuses to coach anybody else. Um, and, you know, along those lines, I also work a lot with amputees, uh, athletes with cerebral palsy, which is a really interesting area. Um, that's an area I definitely need to grow, grow my, my expertise in and hopefully get stronger at. And uh, working with athletes with spinal cord injuries who are, you know, wheelchair based. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of a new role. The USC opened, opened it up for me um, going back three seasons ago, heading into my fourth year, as I said earlier. Um, they're building a performance staff and performance network. I'm not full time with Para. I still get to assist with the resident programs, which is great because I have a good balance of assisting with able body athletes while learning from the para athletes. And uh, we, we've got a sport dietitian on staff. We've got a sports medicine member who's kind of specializing in para athletes. Uh, we all work under the same high performance director, and we're slowly growing a, an integrated holistic approach. Um, so again, it's kind of been a, a trailblazing position for the USOC, and it's growing. So now there are more people I can kind of bounce ideas off of. Um, luckily, overseas. Different nations have kind of had these roles in place. So there are people that know more about it than I do that I can kind of rely on uh, for networking. Uh, but as far as the states go, a lot of times I'm kind of looked to from sport coaches as, as an expert in the area. And again, I'm only four years into it, so it's kind of hard to even pretend I am. Um, so each year, just growing, trying to be better than I am the year before, and hopefully know more about each specific disability that, that I get to work with. Now, you mentioned four extremely different type of athletes right and i could only imagine how that has to keep you on your toes when it comes to programming so let's let's start with the visually impaired athletes that you work with how has that changed you as a coach what has that taught you and how has that made you better not just for them but for the other ones that you work with Right. No, that's a great question, Coach. And I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, have shared this experience with interns in the past, too, and, and just kind of see how it opens their eyes as well as my own to, to different ideas and concepts. Um, just looking at, you know, whether it be more learning or, or how we communicate, um, getting messages across. Obviously, you can't demo anything. Um, you can use tactile, you know, hands-on approach and try to get athletes in position so they can feel it themselves. But you have to be super crisp and clear with your communication. Um, and for me, that's been a, a great lesson uh, in communicating. Um, so again, you know, one of the VI athletes I work with, who's who's a vet, he's a pro, he's the world record uh, holder for the long jump in the T11 category, which is completely uh, visually impaired. And uh, he tells a story of one of the first interns he ever had trying to teach him how to, you know, get into triple extension position. And the coach just kept yelling triple extension, triple extension, and uh, you know, the athlete didn't know what that meant. <laughs> So we can talk about certain things and demonstrate certain things, but the athlete has no clue what that means. And, you know, you got to find creative ways to put them in those positions and, and try to open up opportunities for them to, to learn, you know, get creative in that setting as well. Because um, if you use cues that they don't relate to and, or if you try to teach a movement they've never seen before, you, you've got to find ways for them to experience it, you know, on their own, really. Yeah. I could only imagine because I'm like, I'm a very like pointy type person like right like like showing by like actually pointing on myself or on them or whatever I could, yeah that would be a really interesting challenge to see how because then you really know if you know how to tell people what they're doing yeah i i think it's it's something i've been blessed to experience and don't always realize how much it's actually helped me um, in certain aha moments where you realize, wow, I've just connected with an able body athlete so much quicker than I might have before um, through just communicating something without even having to demonstrate it. Um, and, you know, and being with the USOC, uh, my second stint uh, working with the Olympic Committee, um, get a lot of experience with international athletes as well. So, you know, not being able to communicate that way with language barriers and then working with VI athletes, not being able to communicate with visual demonstration. I sometimes joke that it would be uh, an interesting uh, opportunity to work with uh, 
a foreign VI athlete and see if you could actually get that done somehow as well. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. Yeah, to, the, to this point, that hasn't come across my table yet. So then bringing in the next group, the, the next right. one you mentioned was the amputees. Right. So looking at how the training off the track works with that, how, how has that – I mean, how, how, how is that different? And then how do you accommodate to different situations? Because it, there could be a vast array of, of different changes required. Yeah, no, completely. Uh, you're hitting the nail on the head. Um, you look at somebody who could be maybe just missing an ankle, and you might look at that and say, well, they can do most, most joints. Their, their knee, their hip can still train. But you got to remember the proprioception from the foot, that, that's just completely half now for that athlete, right? So balance and stability are going to be an issue you're going to want to address, uh, in my opinion. Um, then you work your way up the chain. You know, if it's below the knee, it's going to be similar. But obviously how those movements are, uh, you know, how they perform these different movement patterns, you just got to be kind of open-minded to, to what's going to be efficient for that individual. Um, it might not be always textbook. Um, but they can solve movement problems and find ways to actually find solutions to, to actually solve those movement problems. Um, you start working way up past them. Obviously, you're only going to do a train at the hip, whether it be ab adduction, flexion extension, or circumduction, right? Um, so with that, you're more limited. But if, if they have a knee joint, you can still perform most lunging patterns, most squatting patterns. You just got to be creative on how it's adapted, um, whether they're going to need something to assist them. Maybe you work with heel wedges. Maybe you work with... Uh, some additional support. Maybe you go from assisted with bands to supported with the TRX to body weight to the goblet squat before just jumping right to the goblet squat. So a lot of times these athletes too in para sport, their training age, you know, on the able body side or the or the Olympic side, most of these athletes are coming through a, a pretty solid foundation of, of a collegiate program. And the training age is something to keep in mind with a Paralympic athlete as well, because I could be working with somebody who's in their late thirties, but they might have just had a recent injury. Uh, in the past two years or three years and just got introduced to Paralympic sports. So their training age is really zero, even though they're an older athlete chronologically uh, or vice versa. I might be working with a young athlete like, uh, uh, you know, let's say Hunter Woodall or Mikey Brannigan who were in our grassroots program. And now they have a pretty robust training age at a younger chronological age. Um, so those are all things to keep in mind as well. Um, obviously with amputation that you could look at an arm amp as well, getting, you know, finding ways to kind of adapt movements, whether if you use special strength bars or safety spot bars or things of that nature, or if you can find ways to load them maybe at the elbow using cables or bands or chains or, or anything along, along that way. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I think that that's really a neat point because they could almost have like four different ages if you may like they could have like their pre-injury training and preparedness yeah. age and then their post-injury training and preparedness age and that's that's fascinating to me and we're talking mainly about the physical but obviously there's a huge mental component to that as well yeah. and making sure an athlete is healthy and have accepted uh you know the cards that have been dealt before we even worry about trying to make leaps and bounds physically right otherwise you're just going to be starting from scratch year after year if they're not fully acceptant of if it was a, a late life accident or a late life injury or disease that, that caused them to be disabled, um, obviously addressing the athlete as an individual holistically, first and foremost, um, not skipping those steps, I think is super important. Um, and then more and more about the physical once we understand that they are a healthy individual. Are you heavily involved in that first part or no? Uh, I get to work with uh, sports psychologists and actual sometimes you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on the case scenario, it could be clinical psychologists as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's, you know, HIPAA involved and things of that nature. But uh, just like any other athlete, you, you work with them long enough or if you can build a strong relationship right off the bat, um, if they're willing to waive certain certain issues, then that information can be shared across interdisciplinary areas. That's crazy, man. I, I couldn't imagine. Like, that would... Um that really puts like the whole thing in perspective. Like when you say that, like taking that step back, like of having that, that hurdle, I mean, no pun intended with track that they that have is. to get <laughs> past yeah. in order to, to be back in their sport. That's yeah. It's, that, it's that's, amazing. Yeah. It's, it, it can be, you know, very, uh, it, this word gets tossed around a lot, but you know, inspiring for lack of a better term. Off the top yeah. Of my head, but, 
you're working with somebody who might have just went from being a competitive D1 soccer player to being in a wheelchair with spinal cord injury. And within a year, you know, they're, they're getting involved with parasport, but have they actually resolved the issue and, and have they accepted, you know, the cards that have been dealt to them before we even worry about pushing the physical boundaries? Um, and, and with along those lines too, I mean, working with a VI athlete um, and, you know, CP athletes, sometimes the uh, spinal cord injury athletes, you really become, for lack of a better term, their, their eyes and their, their guide. Um, you know, I kind of skipped on that with the VIs earlier you have to physically guide them through a crowded weight room. You can't just have them show up, right? So it has to turn into small group one-on-one -on -one training sometimes where we might have, you know, the shot putters in and we got big, strong athletes um, and you got a VI athlete who shows up. You, you're, you're helping them manage and navigate their way through training, not just giving them a piece of paper and saying, get to work, um, as well as somebody with a spinal cord injury. You may actually be helping them with chair transfers, getting them in and out of chair, onto equipment, off equipment, making sure the equipment's adjusted and safe so that they're strapped in and supported for any go for load. Um, so those are all little things that you learn along the way. Um, and again, there was really no formal training process for me. Um, oh, I think I the, more, the more you can can lean on these athletes and build that relationship, hopefully uh, some of the best adaptations we've come up with for training modalities have been through conversations with the athlete. They come up with things quicker than I do. Um, so having those conversations right off the bat can save you a lot of time on the back end. That makes a lot of sense, though, because, like, I mean, that's that they live it. Right, right. And they'll come up with things, too. You know, the ones who really enjoy the training process will come in and, and they'll challenge you. Like, hey, what do you think about this? Or, hey, I was thinking if we put the cable here versus there, you know, what do, what do you think that would do? And, you know, and, and getting away from maybe some of the things that we, we use traditionally, you know, Obviously, you know, I'm a huge fan of weightlifting movements and powerlifting movements, and, you know, I think they have their place uh, in performance, but certain athletes are, are, you might have to maybe even use a Chuck Norris total gym to get a push-pull combination going. You know, you have to really kind of step back and get creative, and for me, it's, it, it's forcing me to be trying to get comfortable being uncomfortable um, and, and just kind of step outside whatever box I thought I had and, and really look at it from a new point of view. You almost can't have a box. You can't. And uh, I, I've always thought of myself to be more kind of uh, uh, principles based versus strict philosophy based. Um, but but now it's like even if you had a group of, of three athletes come in who are all 100 meter sprinters, well, one's got CP. OK, is he diaplegia, monoplegia? Where is he split? How does the CP affect him? Is Does he get super fatigued? Do we need a three hour gap or do we maybe need a five hour gap between training sessions? Right. That, that whole idea of fatigue management, which is kind of a, a sexy buzz term that Working with a CP athlete, man, that's really going to challenge you from a neurological standpoint, right? Then you move on to a VI athlete. Well, he's, for lack of a better term, he's, he's physically capable of doing movements. It's just you're kind of only limited by your own coaching creativity and your own coaching communication. So th there's no two programs. I know people talk about individual, individualization, but uh, for the group of, it might only be, let's say, 20 uh, para track athletes, but that's 20 individual programs right there. And that's for half of them, that might be hands-on for every hour of training as well. Um, so it adds it adds time to your day, but I enjoy uh, I enjoy the challenge, and I've kind of always enjoyed not to make light of disabilities, but but problem solving. So this role for me has been been a blessing, and I'm, I'm you know super excited to to be a part of what we're doing. Not taking any away anything away from the able-bodied athletes that you work right. with, right? Right. No. But how much more rewarding is it to watch those people compete? <laughs> You know, we, we've had we've had the flywheel spinning in the right direction, and we've had a lot of success the past few years. You know, the training center uh, won a bunch of medals in the Olympics, and we won a lot of medals in the Paralympics, and we can get caught up in numbers in the society so easily. And uh, for me, I, I wasn't able to go to, to Rio. Um, we would have had to lose one of our coaching accreditations if I went, and, you know, being a team player, you know, <laughs> I think it's more important for the sport coaches to be there than maybe the S&C staff. Um, and Paralympic Games being a lot shorter than the Olympic Games, there wasn't a whole lot of training we were going to do anyway. So, so I stayed back. So obviously, personally, I would have loved to have been there, but it is what it is. And um, the athletes go down, and I, I see the van coming back from the airport, and literally the, the whole group came off the van and came right to the weight room to show off their hardware, or even if they didn't win anything, to just come and tell me about the experience and, and what it meant to them to be a Paralympian. And uh, to see them come off the bus and come right to the weight room after a you know an eighteen hour flight or whatever it was was one of the highlights of my career, if not the highlight. 
I, I can't even imagine like how awesome that was. Yeah, it, it's been it's been like I said, it's been a true blessing. I'm fortunate to have this role, and uh, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by great people, great sport coaches that I can learn from, and, and specifically in the sport of track and field. I mean, we're talking about some really brilliant coaches here, and great supporting staff. You know, whether it be Jamie Myers, the other SNC I work with, and, and uh, Liz Broad, the dietitian I work with, specifically on the power side, and our sports med staff, our sports psychologists, our sports psychologists. I get to, uh, you know, I, I enjoy all things performance, but I get to learn from people who know way more about their given areas than I do. And I get to just focus on my area as far as application goes, um, which, you know, again, is a blessing in disguise as well. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I, I, cause I had a kid who went to Rio and that was like, that, that was unbelievable. I can only imagine like, because this is a completely and totally different investment than what most people in, in high performance are used to. I can only imagine like how much more like personal these relationships become because of everything that you go through with these young men and women. Yeah, it's uh, you know, and I've been fortunate to be at a lot of a lot of. I guess interesting settings, you know, my, my, my CV to get to this point isn't probably what would be considered typical in the SEC profession. Um, and everywhere I've been, it, I've been able to, to experience some really unique, unique things. And it's been a great journey along the way. But, but again, here with the para athletes, like you said, you know, if you are physically guiding an athlete through the training process, uh, literally, not just figuratively, and, uh, they they reach a new level of success they didn't think was possible. Um, for me, there's definitely a special connection that that I haven't necessarily experienced in other places. Oh, I, I can only imagine. So let's get back to the athletes now. So we talked about uh, the VI people that you have. Right. We talked about the amputees. Um, right. Let's talk a bit about the the spinal cord people, the wheelchair athletes, because this is what I think that people it kind of resonates better with people that they because they, they've seen it a lot more often. Right, right, yeah. Well, you know, I guess David Wagner for for quad tennis, uh, he's in the the uh, quad open uh, division. He obviously it's it's Paralympic sport, right? So there's not a whole lot of publicity. It's uh, the flywheel spinning again. To use that analogy again, the uh, going into Rio, there were a lot of advertisements that included sponsorship showing the para-athlete as well as the Olympic athlete, whereas in years past, no one even really understood what Paralympics was. You know, I had people not just, just ignorant of the fact of what it was and, and not meaning any disrespect to them, thinking I actually worked with Special Olympics, you know, and it, there's there's a little bit of a difference there. Uh, we're talking strictly about physical uh, disabilities. And uh, with the, uh, um, you know, going back to the spinal cord injury, uh, Dave Wagner, you know, he's won, I believe it's 22 uh, Grand Slams now. Um, so you can make the argument that he's the most decorated male tennis player in U.S. history. Um, I know Sampras had, what, 14 or 15 on singles. Dave plays singles and quads, so obviously he's had more opportunities. Um, but, you know, he's definitely not going to be a celebrity. People are lining up down the road to, to, to get an autograph from if you just saw him pushing his chair down the street. But gifted, gifted, gifted tennis player, man, just amazing. And, um, you know, working with him, he's he's an older athlete, so – for him specifically, it's been a process of addition by subtraction. You know, instead of just adding more things to his plate, we've been just taking things off of his plate. He's been just worrying more and more about playing good tennis. He's physically fit enough to recover uh, between bouts. He's physically fit enough to withstand a long extended bout. Um, in the past, there was just a huge emphasis on, this, on the physical end of it. And now we're just spending more time making sure that he stays sharp, you know, technically and tactically. And that he's, he's good to go mentally. Um, so I've actually been removing myself or, or some of the things we had done in the past from the process, and he's getting better as he gets older. So uh, just to highlight the fact, you know, you go back to um, always focusing on the physical side of things. Sometimes we need to, 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 I think, get some addition from subtraction. Oh, no, 100%. And I think that that's a good point that goes across the board with everybody. Yeah, and, and with him specifically, you know, we look at somebody who's using the shoulder joint as a main mode of locomotion, right? Was that what it was initially intended for? Probably not, right? If we look at human anatomy and even if you were an evolutionist, like that, there was no point of view where we ever said the shoulder joint should be a main motor of locomotion. So now he's using that for his daily life. 
So if you get an injury, we're not just talking about sprained ankle, I got to sit out a basketball game. We're talking about him getting in and out of his chair, him using the ability to get out and use the facilities or, or use the catheter and change the catheter. You're talking about the ability to, to maybe avoid a UTI and the ability to avoid maybe a prolonged stay at the hospital. Um, if you tear a muscle on the shoulder, that, that's completely debilitating the individual. So you got to really focus on what's truly fundamental and essential for those athletes and making sure you're not just adding things in because they can do it. You know, what is essential just because you can, does that mean you should? And making sure that we're not just, oh, I came up with this cool creative way to, to get a heavy press or a heavy pull for a disabled athlete. Well, that's great that you're thinking that, you know, open box mindset, but what is essential for that individual and, and what does that mean for them holistically, not just from a performance standpoint? What you just said there about, I mean, all that and how something like that can just be so debilitating. Right. How long did it take for you to come to that realization? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, within the first year, um, but I didn't show up thinking that way. I'll be honest. I, the first year working with uh, Dave specifically in that scenario, you know, uh, I was already thinking there was a lot going on from the from the physical performance side, and he being an older athlete and a, a, a experienced veteran athlete, I wasn't sure that that was completely necessary. But you know, looking at okay, we'll get in one heavy press and one heavy pull a week. Uh, you know, finding cool ways to get that done, I, I probably wasted a good three or four months, and and you know that was definitely a failure, and that's a lesson I've learned from. Yeah. Cause that was just like, that hit me like right in the face when you said that. It's like, holy mackerel. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of creative ways you can adapt these exercises and these athletes, they, the ones that are committed to it, they want to get big and strong. They want to get better, right? You know, whatever that means for their particular sport. But again, just because you can find something for them to do it, is that essential? Is that necessary? Um, and take a, take an extra step back because it's not just, Oh man, I'm, I'm missing a training session. My shoulder's a little sore this week. I can't do a throwing session. It's, hey man, my shoulder's sore. I literally can't get out of my wheelchair today. You know that that's a lot different in my opinion. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, it, no, that's just a lot different. Like period. Like that. Yeah. Wow. And it's not, hey, you know, don't push the envelope and don't train and don't try to get better, but really make sure you, you got things lined up before you just take a swing at it. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. So I, I do want to get to two more points though. So let, let's talk about, and this actually like for my family, I, I'm actually really excited to hear how you handle your CP athletes because I haven't, I had an aunt who was, uh, who had CP. So this is actually something that really intrigues me because it's, um, it's obviously something that, that we've had, near and dear to us for as long as I've been alive. Yeah, no, Jay, and it's funny, you know, the older you get in life, the more you can reflect and look back at certain things. And I actually grew up with a, with a foster sister with CP. And I didn't realize that, you know, from the ages of, of basically zero to seven, I was getting some very informal experience and exposure to, to that specific disability that looking back now, I can make a lot of, a lot of, um, I guess parallels to, and um, CP is a challenge. It's a uh, you know it's an unfortunate situation that that people experience, and you know the CP athlete. How do you work with them? Um, is it again? Are they are they going to have issues looking split maybe left to right? Are they having imbalances where their right side is going to be, for lack of a better term, not as strong or efficient as their their left side, or as coordinated specifically? Or are we looking half? top half versus bottom half where maybe a guy's uh, a pushing athlete a sprinter in a chair but really has a hard time walking um or are we looking at maybe somebody who's only affected by one limb or are we looking at somebody who's affected as a, as a whole you know from from their entire motor control standpoint from their head down through the toes toenails to fingernails um so that's four different categories right there and then within that you have it's it's tough to really classify those athletes because depending on on how fatigued they are, whether it be from a chronic or an acute standpoint, their motor control and their, their motor expressions are just going to be um, all over the map. I can have a guy who comes in one day who's had plenty of rest and is feeling good, and he, I can do all sorts of things with him. I have a 
the same athlete shows up the next day or a week later, maybe on the same training plan. And you think, okay, well, on this particular day, he's going to be coming in feeling fresh. And they're, they're not. They just don't have it that day. Um, so you got to be willing to, to kind of make those daily adjustments and find ways to, to try to create. I don't think you're ever going to create complete symmetry, let's say, um, but finding ways to make sure that we're addressing that and, and making sure that we're monitoring so that you can hopefully figure out if it is, in fact, helping performance. But again, zoom out and look at them as, a, as an individual from a health standpoint. You know, if I have a chair athlete who's using their upper body only for competition, does that mean I'm not going to try to help them learn how to squat or lunge or hinge or maybe even land if we can progress that far? Um, for them as an individual from a holistic standpoint, I think that's important um, for them to actually get to the point where they can walk more comfortably or more confidently and maybe even for longer periods of time. Now, is that going to help them be better at pushing? And racing in a chair, maybe not, but hopefully as an individual, it builds confidence, self-esteem, and, and reassurance that they feel a little more as part of society and can, can participate more in daily activities that they might not have beforehand. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Like, awesome. So now, tying it all in, let's talk about how all of this works in with the able-bodied athletes that you have out there, too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really unique spot, Jay. Um, you know, we have the shot putters. We were fortunate where the three shot putters from, from the facility um, just finished one, two, three in Diamond League. You know, we have multiple medalists in our long jump program and, and triple jump program. And uh, it's, it's a special place where these athletes aren't necessarily secluded. They're all living together, training together, eating together. We have coaches who coach both sides of the house and they all train together so take a guy like lex Gillette, world record holder for t11 for long jump he trains right with Brittany reese and, and will clay they're all in the same group coach working with coach jeremy fisher and they, they all get to train as, as one unit and there's there's not this big division between para and olympic down here in chula vista it's it's kind of very inclusive in my opinion we have a coach who specializes in paralympic track and field and he's got the majority of the athletes under his belt uh under his tutelage and his program and that's Coach Jackie Cruz, who I am beyond fortunate to work with. The guy's uh, an absolute legend, um, former world record holder in the 800 meter, still I think top six all time, was the flag bearer for Rio down in Brazil. Uh, if you go down to Brazil, that guy's Michael Jordan, right? And it's not just because he was a great athlete that I'm fortunate to work with him. He's an amazing coach, both with able body and uh, Paralympic athletes. He's been doing this for 12 years now, and I can I can learn a lot from Coach Cruz, and I have learned a lot from Coach Cruz the past four years. And um, you know, whether it be programming or just communication or, or just general philosophies as a whole, you know, learning more about, about patients as well. Um, you learn a lot about patients working with the sport population. Um, so it, it's a unique setting. We have a lot of gifted athletes both sides of the house. There's only two full, you know, strength coaches down here that work with Team USA. It's myself and Jamie Myers. He takes the lead on the able body side. And I get to assist with that program on a daily basis for all the athletes that come through. And he gets to help me out or, or work with some of the power athletes as well. And um, we get to work together as a team. So there's not really this big division. We kind of all cross paths and all work and just we work with each other as a team at the end of the day. Or at least that's the goal. Yeah. No, man, that's awesome. And it's awesome work that you guys are doing out there. And this is some freaking killer stuff that can be transformed into every line of coaching with things that we need to look at and think about more and be better at and sam i can't thank you enough for the time man and i keep doing your thing out there man it this is really fantastic and, and what the work you're doing is awesome and, and i truly appreciate it man thank you very much yeah yeah i really appreciate the kind words man i don't you know don't know if i'm always uh deserving of them but i appreciate it nonetheless and i just want to highlight the fact that I've been a fan of yours from afar. I think you're doing great work and, and doing it for the right reasons too. Um, getting a lot of great content out there for coaches. Uh, anything I said that, that people liked, I've, I've been fortunate to learn from some great individuals over the years that probably came from them. And anything you didn't agree with, that probably came from me. So let's not give me uh, too much credit here. Well, listen, either way, man, this is killer, absolutely killer stuff. And Really excited to hear, you know, what you're doing out there. And I, I can't thank you enough for the time, man. We will be in touch real soon. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks a lot, Coach. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. And a huge thank you to the USOC, Sam Gardner, for taking the time to sit down and talk with us today. I mean, you know, guys, just fascinating stuff that just has to make you take a step back and think about what we're doing. And 
kudos to Sam for the amazing work he's doing. Um, the only thing that I'm going to ask with this episode, guys, follow the links below. Check out the website. Check out their Facebook. Follow them on Twitter and support these athletes. You know, these men and women um, are representing the United States of America um, in, in these sporting events. So please uh, support them. Do whatever you can. Uh, and that would be greatly appreciated. And as always, guys, thank you for being part of what we do here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.